You're about to join Jerry Parker, Maritz Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Moritz Siebert and I, Niels Kasselblasen, are back with this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series, which is our weekly ongoing raw exploration of the world of rules-based investing, and of course, where we also take some of your questions. But today, just like last week, we're going to deviate from our usual format because we have a fantastic guest joining us today, namely Eric Crittenden. Eric is someone we have wanted to come on the show for a while, and I'm sure you'll agree that it is perfect timing to have someone with his experience on the show at this particular time. So let me start by saying welcome to the show, Eric. We're really delighted to be speaking with you today. And of course, good afternoon to you, Moritz. Hope you're doing well after a, a busy week, no doubt. Thanks for having me, guys. Good morning, Eric. Good afternoon, Niels. Now, we have lots to talk to you about, uh, Eric, but since we usually do a quick run-through of the week uh, in terms of what took place inside the trend-following portfolios we work with, perhaps since it's early morning, your time, you can have a, an extra sip of your coffee whilst Morris and I will do a quick uh, run-through. Um, and let me also just say that because of what's happening um, we do see some um, slower internet uh, bandwidth uh, where where we are individually. So if the sound quality at some stage uh, might not be our usual quality, I apologize in advance, but there's nothing we can do about it. From a market point of view, not going to say a lot. I think most of you listening today uh, will be aware of what's going on. Financial markets, of course, have experienced the fastest ever crash over the past few weeks. Um, even during the dot-com burst and the Lehman crisis, stocks did not fall this quick. Um, in less than a month, we've seen major indices fall by about 30% or more. Uh, and stocks in some sectors like oil and gas and travel down by 80% in some instances. Um, and, um, you know, we are seeing some pretty um, eye-opening daily declines uh, not seen since 1929, um, which, of course, preceded the Great uh, Depression. I think we've even seen some some eight standard deviation daily moves in the stock markets. And just looking down my screen, I can see some year-to-date numbers, um, you know, much worse than what we've seen in the U.S. Um, you know, France is down almost 40%, Germany almost 40%, the U.K. down 40% this year, the Australia. Um, so um, so the 25% the S&P is down um, is not even the worst of what we've seen. Moritz, um, how was your week? Good week. What a time to be trading those markets. Everything, like you say, Neil, seems to be down. All the assets go down, regardless of what it is. Volatility goes up, I guess, but uh, all the other assets go down. Um, regardless, I had a good week, 4.57% uh, up. So I'm a st slightly north of 5% up year to date now. Uh, and of course, you know, last week, this was being short crude, short the equities, short copper, short cotton. Short emissions. Interestingly, as you can hear from what I'm saying, all of the PL, most of the substantial PL, I should say, is coming from short positions. And we've said this a couple of times that the shorts are so important in the diversified trend following system. And here's the proof um, none of the longs that I have on, and there aren't that many left, are making any substantial amounts of money. It's really coming from the short positions. Um, some losers along the bobble. And here's the, the really the interesting thing, being short the topic. So being short Japanese equities last week, that didn't work. So the Bank of Japan is this massive buyer of equities. Um, didn't lose much on that. It's kind of like flattish. Uh, but Topix has outperformed all the other major equity indices uh, in this past week. Yeah, it certainly has been an interesting week on our side as well. Um, you know, it was a good week. Uh, once again, low vol. Uh, low daily uh, volatility um, and 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 a good week as well and a good month so far. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, it feels like you know we've been saying this for so long that it's almost a little bit surreal that now it's happening and now these strategies are showing their worth. Um, 
Um, but because we've been saying this for so long where people just would ignore it because equities were doing their thing, um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, I would say it's almost a shame that things are happening so quickly because I don't think people, I, I think people might think that this is going to be over soon because it's going down so much. But I mean, frankly, it's only been three weeks and this could be the beginning of something uh, much more long term anyway. So on our side, you know, clearly there were some um, uh, good returns. Um, but actually on our side, actually some of the things that did work out was not necessarily from direct long exposure, but we did make mo some money in volatility this week. Um, so that's nice. Um, and of course, you know, the dollar did go up uh, finally, so that's helped out. Um, and But of course, energies and metals were kind of the driving force. Not so much, uh, you know, not so much luck with fixed income that, uh, you know, took a little bit of a, a breather. And of course, uh, equities, lots of uh, volatility during the week. Um, and we also lost a little bit of uh, money on the grains. But frankly, overall, um, it was fine and um, still very low on the risk budget. That's obviously how we operate when volatility um, explodes like we've seen and correlations change, then um, we become somewhat defensive. Uh, everything, of course, in a systematic fashion. So anyways, that's where we are. But we want to get to uh, something much more interesting. And that is straight over to you, Eric. Um, you know, it's... Um, I'm sure a lot of the people who listen to us are already familiar with you, your story, your work, but I think it might be a good idea just to get a quick kind of refresher uh, of how you got to where you are today. And not least because I know there's been some recent changes, uh, new venture for you. So why don't you give us a little bit of context uh, for our conversation today? Sure, I can do that. Um, so my name is Eric Crittenden. I'm the uh, Chief Investment Officer at Standpoint Asset Management, and we focus on multi-asset investing, and specifically that means blending managed futures with equities. Uh, we believe in that. It's, it's what I've uh, done with my own money for some time now, and that's our specialty. Prior to Standpoint, I was the CIO of Longboard Asset Management for seven and a half years, and before that, Blackstar Funds, which you may remember some of the white papers and research that that we published back in the black star days when we had more of an equity focus and before that i worked for a local hedge fund called lens and capital partners on the trade desk and in research and before that i was a research a quantitative research analyst for a relatively large family office in the state of kansas in the american midwest Sounds good. Now, I know Moritz uh, and I, we individually have lots of questions for you. I just want to bridge the gap a little bit sort of uh, uh, as part of your history. And that is really when you first came to uh, in touch, so to, so to speak, when you first got exposed uh, to trend following, because that obviously has been uh, quite a, a core feature in, in your in your recent uh, years. So, what 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 was it that caught your attention about trend following, and what was it that convinced you that this is something you were going to spend a lot more time on? Uh, there were three things historically that happened in stages, uh, and one of them is kind of an embarrassing story. Uh, coming out of college, I hated the concept of trend following. Um, I thought it was juvenile, and you're just chasing performance, and um, you know the stereotype. Everyone does that. So I was an arbitrage guy, and I uh, had an ego, and I thought I thought I was smart, and I was uh, going to pursue a career in structuring complicated derivatives combinations and spreads and three-way spreads and relative value and whatnot. Um, but at one point, one of my classes, uh, th with a project that I was tasked with was to build a mechanical trading system. And in my infinite wisdom back then, I decided oh, this is going to be easy. I'm going to buy 52-week lows and I'm going to sell 52-week highs because you can see on the chart that those are great entry and exit points. And uh, I'm going to build this machine that just prints money. And this was back in the mid-1990s. So it was a long time ago. And uh, I built this thing and I back-tested it and it was fantastic. It had a sharp ratio of two and a half, you know, 90% winners and it was amazing. Uh, but an interesting thing happened when I ran it in real life. Because uh, my the project required that I run it for a full semester. 
And I noticed that this thing uh, lost quite a bit of money in real life. But the back test continued to say that it worked quite well. And that's how I learned about survivorship bias, post-dictive error, all the things that plague system developers in, in our space. And it was an eye-opening experience because it forces you to see this, um, this hidden realm of cognitive biases and database errors and whatnot. And that's a great way to learn. And I did it with uh, paper transactions. It wasn't real money, but still, it was, a, it, was hum- it was a humbling experience that forced me to recognize that things are not what they seem. You can't just look at what's being presented to you. You really, if you're going to do backtesting, simulations, strategy design, you need to replicate history as it actually unfolded. Don't just take the convenient package that's available to you at the time. So that was an eye-opening experience. Uh, that was kind of stage one. Um, stage two was watching some of my really intelligent colleagues uh, struggle with some of those issues and other ones in the real world with real money and stumbling upon trend followers like Salem Abraham and Jerry Parker, uh, Milburn and Don and some others and um, seeing that what they do uh, is called trend following, but it couldn't be more contrarian to the instincts of novice uh, market participants. So um, I had to concede that this actually makes a lot of sense and it is actually very contrarian. Does that make sense? Yeah, it certainly does. It certainly does. I mean, it's uh, we've all been taught, you know, buy low, sell high, right? So uh, doing the exact opposite doesn't seem to be the most natural thing in the world. Do you think, Eric, that that is the reason why trend following works? It's because it's so contrarian and so difficult to uh, to do? I think it's a, it's a big part of the reason. I think it's the reason that it sustains. I don't think it's the original root cause of why it works, but I do think it's the reason that um, the margins persist over time. I think I remember, and I may be completely off of that, I think you were on a podcast with uh, Mike Covell probably a couple of years back and you were mentioning the effect of hedgers uh, in markets and that maybe, I may be, like I say, I may be, I may be off on that, that maybe, maybe hedgers, they want to lose money and we as trend followers pick that up and that's kind of like uh, a part of the alpha that we make. So another uh, pivotal moment for me was in the late 90s. Um, I went to college in Kansas in a, in a really boring part of the state where uh, Coke Industries, uh, the big commodity trading firm, is is headquartered. And there's, n- there's not a lot to do there. And Coke had recruited a lot of um, finance and economics PhDs from around the world to come work on their, on their hedging desk and their trading desks and whatnot. So a lot of these guys were from Russia and, and other places, and they just didn't have anything to do. So they eventually found me in the little club that I created at Wichita State University that... Um, was kind of a quant club, you know, before quants were, were a real term. And I spent a lot of time with them and other people from Cargill, um, corporate farming entities and whatnot. And these people were tasked with building and maintaining hedging models. And they moved a lot of size, enormous size. And, you know, we were writing code back then in Pascal and Fortran and um, C++ and whatnot. So, we, we spent a lot of time looking at their models. They, they sought out help from me and, and programmers that were better than me. And I just couldn't understand uh, one key aspect of what they were doing until it dawned on me. They're not actually trying to make money, which was shocking to me. You know, I, I come from the, the, the speculator side, the investor side. And I remember having discussions with them, like, what are you guys doing? And they were so confused why I, w- why I was confused. <laughs> and then it, it dawned on me and, and I realized that it's not their job to make money on their derivatives positions. It's their job to harvest negative correlation to the, the risks in their core business that they don't want to be taking. Even their compensation was tied to... Um, maintaining this correlation so they're not profit seeking and then that made me think about my own grandfather you know one grandfather was a hog farmer the other one was a a wheat farmer and they would hedge and they're not trying i mean if they make money on their hedge they're they're thankful that they're making money on the hedge but as a business they're not doing better they're actually doing worse so here we have these futures markets which are big and deep and liquid but let's be honest they are a zero-sum game actually negative sum after trading costs and brokerage uh, costs. 
So you're participating in a negative sum game. For you to profit to the tune of 8, 10, 12% a year, somebody has to be losing that money on the other side. And if you're going to do it over the long term, it needs to be sustainable. Now, who are those other people? Well, if we look at the lineup of participants in the futures markets, you can break them down into three categories, hedgers, large speculators, and small speculators. Now, when I look at the other large speculators in the world, and I think to myself, am I really going to rip money away from these guys consistently over the long term? And I look at what they do. They're smart. They're active. They don't like losses. When they lose money, they get smaller. They hide you know, they lower position sizes. I and mean, that's a terrible customer to have. Um, and that gladiator mentality of, as I'm going to be smarter and faster and stronger than them and take money from them, that's great for a movie, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I don't see how you scale a business around that approach. And you're certainly not going to compound off the backs of small speculators. The, the math simply doesn't work. So that leaves you with the hedgers. And the fact that they're not profit-seeking in the futures markets, uh, that's meaningful to me. Now, here's where it gets interesting, though. Um, the way you make money from them is through really big moves. And they're infrequent. And they're all over the place. Sometimes it's in grain, sometimes it's in soft, sometimes it's in bonds, so on and so forth. Uh, if you look at the life of a systematic trend follower in the futures markets, it gives you nothing that's psychologically comfortable, nothing at all. Your position sizing is not comfortable your entries, your exits, it's discomfort across the board. And I love that. I love it because it means you have to build a system that's disciplined and stable and durable, and you have to let it do its thing over the long term. And that's just outside of the scope of most people's um, ability and willingness to do. And that's what I mean when I say trend following in practice is as contrary as anything you'll ever do. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's a great, um, great way of uh, explaining it uh, for sure. Now, I mean, you referred initially, you said that what you do today with your new business is something you've been doing for a while uh, yourself. And so I was just thinking about maybe in your view, I mean, and you can think about yourself as, as an individual or, or what you do uh, in terms of the new products, whatever. But I mean, what do you think it takes nowadays to be a successful investor? I mean, what what are the... That's a great question. Um, I could go many different directions with that, but the one that comes to mind is I, I think a lot of people have lost lost touch with what, what does it mean to be an investor? Why should you be able to take money, hand it off to someone else, and then get returns? You know, have 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 that money grow over time at a rate that's greater than inflation. You don't get something for nothing. There's no alchemy going on here. So it doesn't take a lot of uh, thought to realize, well, it's risk. We take risk. You know, it's, we have money. Somebody else needs it. Uh, and we have the ability to take risk. So we're going to do that. Uh, and if we do it well and we do it correctly, we should earn some sort of a risk premium over time. Well, what is risk? Risk is volatility. Risk is drawdown. Risk is uh, temporary loss. And risk is permanent loss. So what perplexes me is why investors get upset when they realize or experience this risk that they've signed up for. Because I don't get upset about it. I look at it and say, oh, this is making sense. You know, for me to compound at 8 or 10% a year for the next 20 years, um, I'm not getting something for nothing. This equation balances and makes sense. So I was on a podcast the other day, um, and I, I said something. I blurted something out that I thought was very interesting. 22 weekdays ago, the U.S. stock market was at a new all-time high. 22 weekdays ago. Uh, and most global stock markets were at a new all-time high. And investors felt great. They felt great. And if we were to go back in time 23 days ago, and I asked just an average investor, can, could the stock market at some point decline by 30%? Almost across the board, everyone would say, well, of course it can. It's done that many times in the past, certainly. Not only can it, it will at some point. Sure, the stock market can decline by 30%. Okay. What if I asked them, could we suffer a global pandemic at some point in the future? Almost everyone would say, of course. We've had dozens and dozens of pandemics over the decades and centuries. 
uh, there's globalization, everything's uh, tightly linked, we're doing a business with China. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's not a question of if, it's only a question of when we'll have a global pandemic. Well, here we are, 22 days later. Why is everyone so surprised? And then I answered my own question and I said, no one is surprised. No one's surprised. And that's evident by the, the fact that everyone would agree. Sure, we can have a 30% decline, no problem. Yes, we can have a pandemic. This is not surprising. The pain is because very few people are prepared. They're, prepared, they're, they're unprepared to experience the risk that they signed up for. And that is interesting to me. The markets are interesting because of well, all the stuff we talked about previously, but the, the psychological and social component is just as interesting. It is so easy to talk about this when you are financially in good shape and you're making all-time highs. Then we can all go out and say, yeah, of course it'll happen. The S&P will be down 30% and at some point a pandemic will happen and maybe there's going to be another war. Whatever is going to be the case, it's so easy to roll that off your tongue when you're making money all the time. But then when you get hit in the face and you're down 15%, it's like you say, all of a sudden that emotion comes back and maybe you need the liquidity. You have been over leveraged, right? The market moves another 15% lower and you're in complete despair. It happens over and over and over again. And that is why I think we three of us agree we want to have those systems in place to just help us guide the way through that. Do you think, Eric, that, okay, so maybe, you know, so we ask this question, why are people surprised? Because we've just, you know, as you rightly say, People agree that these things can happen. What has not happened before, I guess, at least not in our lifetime, um, is the speed, right? So do you think that that that, that is surprising, uh, so to speak? I mean, is that the surprise, that this is happening much faster than what we've seen before, even after we put in circuit breakers, which we didn't used to have, and all this other... I mean, I think the three of us would probably agree we know why it's happened because the system has been incredibly stretched and all of that stuff. But but do you think that is the surprise to people? That it's just happening quicker than they can even, you know, manage to do anything about it? I think the speed has been a bit of a surprise to people. Um, I also think the speed is, is not that meaningful to, to investors. I don't think that if you if you stretch this out over um, six weeks instead of three weeks, that the pain and the fear would be um, meaningfully less. I don't think that that's a linear one to one relationship. Now, the speed has really surprised um, structural participants, you know, market makers and banks, um, liquidity providers and whatnot. They've got problems because of the speed. You know, the crash of 87 was very, very problematic. If that had happened over a period of 40 trading days rather than one, it would have been less traumatic to the vendors and the, you know, the participants in the, in the microstructure of the markets. But when we're talking about individual investors, I don't think that that is um, the speed is that big of a deal. You know, if, it, if this took if this happened over six weeks, I don't think they'd be feeling that different. Because what difference does that make? There, you know, if you had a net worth of $2 million and now you're down around 1.2 and you're worried about going below one, you know, whether that happened in three weeks or six weeks, it's, I don't think it's that different psychologically for an investor. No, I wonder if, I mean, a lot of this obviously has to do with people's behavior. And I wonder whether the speed of things has just meant that people haven't had a chance to, to do anything because, you know, probably very few people, um, a few people who, some of them been on on the podcast have kind of, you know, talked about that that this is what happens when you stretch the elastic band. Like people like Chris Cole and 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 other people in that camp, of course, have, you know, talked about that that is probably what will happen. And now it's playing out. And uh, and uh, so, um, but it's it's super fascinating. Now, speed is interesting in my from my point of view. Speed is interesting because. It also relates back to what we do, right? Because we often talk about this thing about crisis versus correction, right? And and how um, it's a little bit random, frankly, um, how we do in the initial phase of a uh, big reversal because it depends on how our positions are. 
and also how how quick the reversal is. We obviously, as a, as an industry, have been under massive criticism for not quote unquote providing crisis alpha. Uh, every time we've seen like a five or ten percent correct, which which to me are corrections, um, and um, and and of course now, in my view, even though it's quick, it's not a correction. It's definitely a crisis. Um, but of course, luckily, fortunately, I mean, a lot of these, a lot of our peers have really done well um, and, and you know, should really be applauded for, I think, for what we've done as an industry in terms of delivering uh, very solid performance during a, a very unusual period of time, which is, you know, something we probably knew that we could do, but it's just been so long since we did it um, that it all it's almost, uh, you know, uh, as, as I said in the beginning of the conversation, it's a little bit surreal that these things are playing out and they're actually playing out uh, with the reaction of our types of systems the way we thought they would, but now they are actually doing it. So, um, yeah, so sp the speed is interesting to me, that that element in terms of, because it it does have a big impact on how, you know, what our performance will be in the response to a crisis uh, to some extent. I remember certainly under the I always get them wrong, but that, you know, of the last two big crises, um, the uh, tech bubble and, and the financial crisis, the initial response, certainly on our side, for our trend following systems, in one of the crises, it took a few months before we really started making money from it. Um, even though we ended up making more money than the other crisis, but in the other crisis, we made money straight out of the bat. So, you know, interesting uh, in my view. Yeah, I think the crisis alpha argument is very dangerous terrain for uh, CTAs to participate on. Not yeah. that the CTAs are being intellectually dishonest. I mean, you, the, the numbers are the numbers. It's just that people's interpretation of that is going to be like you described. You know, every 8 to 10% correction, they're going to expect you to uh, make profits. And that, so they're expecting you to, to behave like a hedger on their behalf. And hedgers don't collect risk premiums. They pay risk premiums. So now I, I've been doing this for about, uh, what is it, 20, 22 years now, and I've learned some tough lessons uh, about how to deal with, um, you know, performance, relative performance, and I have a, a policy that called the no high five policy, and that is, um, you, you alluded to this uh, a few minutes ago about the, the, it's a little bit random what happens right at first. It depends on how you're positioned. So sometimes CTAs are going to be positioned to immediately benefit from a flight to quality event. And that seems to be what's happening right now. So I'm telling my own partners and, and investors, don't get carried away. This is not always how it plays out. Sometimes there's a lead lag. Um, and, you know, CTAs can lose money um, with at the same time that the stock market's going down and often will in that first few innings. It's a baseball analogy. I don't know if you European guys are going to get that, but we get uh, in, it. The, in the first few innings of a, of a market decline, and if you're in the habit of extrapolating that out into the future, you're just, you're going to have a bad experience. So it's important to understand, in my opinion, and uh, people are going to disagree with me. You know, maybe it's their job to provide crisis alpha. I view uh, managed futures, trend following CTAs, as a diversifier and something that shouldn't be expected to be highly correlated with your equities or your high yield bonds or your real estate, uh, not be highly correlated over the long term. But in the short term, there's a lot of stuff that's out of our control and you're going to see correlations that are swing from positive to negative and vice versa over time. I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that, Eric, that this time we were positioned correctly. I actually don't think we were, certainly not on our side. We were pretty long equities on the 21st of February because we had to be. That's where the trends were. So, but but I know what you mean, but it's, it's, it's just, you know, again, just random to some extent how it all plays out. What was your other positions? Were you long bonds or short bonds or whatever it is? Short um, crude. And, short crude. Uh, short crude, exactly, on the day where it dropped 30% over, over, over the weekend. I mean, all of these things, right? And this is also why we've been saying for years on the podcast, you don't try and time what we do. You have mm. to have it as a core allocation. You know, even us from the inside, we can't time what we do. It's just completely impossible. And and of course, as we all know, I mean, that, um, that story got a little bit tired after 
11 years of a massive raging bull market in equities, um, people kind of forgot, um, you know, why they needed us. Because, of course, these things just keep working, or the traditional stuff. And then came risk parity, where you could just say, oh, yeah, long bonds with leverage and long stocks. That's even better, right? And it's, yeah, we are where we are today be because of that. Lessons learned. Every every week these days, I'm reminded that in the past uh, one and a half to two years, we've heard more and more people say that, you know, trend following returns are decaying or that trend following is about to stop working or that it's potentially overcrowded. And some of the large players have reduced the weight that they give trend following in their multi-strat quant portfolios. And here we are, you know, we're one of those strategies actually making money these days. And um, I just want to get your opinion on this, Eric. What what do you view of this? Um, is it overcrowded? Is is there an observation that you think um, the returns are decaying over time? Or has that just been a, you know, an observation uh, that's been done over a too short period of time? Yeah, I have some strong opinions on this topic that I think will be somewhat surprising. I do believe that the returns have decayed. Uh, it just doesn't bother me because I think anything that scales and becomes mainstream and becomes that slides into a sustainable trajectory, you're going to see the returns decay. You're going to see the sharp ratios decay, and they're going to decay to a sustainable level, just like anything. You know, small caps used to trend amazingly well. The S&P 500 used to trend amazingly well until it became, you know, it, the transition was sometime in the mid-90s. And it settled into a more sustainable signal-to-noise ratio, um, a sustainable uh, serial correlation underneath the hood. Um, you saw the correlations between the cross correlations between the different components of the S and P 500 kind of hit an asymptote. Um, this stuff doesn't freak me out. I don't know why everyone argues and fights over this because that's what you see in any line of business, whether you're selling hot dogs in front of a baseball stadium or life insurance or whatever. This is a business. There are profit margins and there are participants and there's going to be ebbs and flow in supply and demand. And as something becomes more mainstream and the liquidity flows in and it becomes scalable, you're going to see that signal to noise go ratio go to a sustainable level. I believe that's all that's happened. And that is not a sign that, oh, this thing's broken or it's not going to work. It's simply a sign of maturity. Now, the other element that people overlook, you guys aren't overlooking this, but a lot of potential clients do, is the degree to which CTAs collect um, the risk-free rate of return on their cash balances. So, you know, when I was a kid and interest rates were 18%, CTAs were making 18% right out of the gate. Um, now that number is zero. So over the last 50 years, the risk-free rate of return, uh, the compounded annual rate is 4.6%, but now it's zero. So when these CTAs report their composite you know, net performance, they're typically including the risk-free rate, um, and that's gone. So if you strip that out of your analysis and you look at the long-term track records of these CTAs, you don't see that much deterioration. It's actually insignificant and well within the the tolerance levels for my thesis about the fact that as situ as um, systems become mature and liquid you're going to see some deterioration and all that to me all that means is that the numbers of the past were too high to be sustainable you're now zeroing in on a sustainable risk premia and i fully expect i could be wrong but i fully expect trend following to collect a sustainable risk premia going forward that is some number that's going to be smaller than what people enjoyed back in the turtle days, the 80s and 90s. But it's going to be a decent number going forward. It's quite interesting. I mean, on some levels, I, I agree with that. But I probably agree with that for maybe slightly different reasons. And then in our experience, so our track record for the current program goes back to 1984. So we have a, you know about 35, 36 years of actual data to compare with. And then we've made some improvements in 2006, 2013. And so if I look at those three periods so from 84 to now, from 06 to now, and from 2013 to now, even with us being not at new all-time highs right this moment, our returns are exactly the same. They're within 1%. Mm. So, and actually on our side, we decided in 2007 to take out 
interesting come from our track record because we didn't think that was that's not what we produce in terms of alpha. So we actually, in the last 13 years, we don't even include interest uh, in our track record. So you could argue that maybe it's even better than it was in the long term. So my, my point is that I actually do believe that you can evolve your strategy to not deteriorate, not maybe even improve. But I do think where we have seen a general deterioration, certainly when you look at the industry and the indices for, for our industry is two things. One, uh, three things actually. One, because of what you just said about interest income going out of the returns, that's for sure. Two, because I think that people realized in order to attract the institutional money, they should lower, re- they should lower volatility. So there have been a deleveraging of the strategies, which is not in our case, since we don't charge a management fee, we have no interest in in lower volatility in our return, in our uh, programs. And thirdly, I think size. I just think size is the killer for all of these strategies. And um, and I just don't think people, you know, investors, the big investors, they pour into the same managers and then they expect them to deliver the same returns as they have in their past track record. And I think that is just a fool's errand. I just think it's impossible to do, not just because they lose some of the smaller markets, which I personally believe is truly important you don't end up with just trading the big liquid financial markets Um, but i just never seen any evidence of people with billions of dollars under management competing to the same degree in terms of delivering high returns as when they were smaller or even against other people that are smaller and i don't know what that magic number is whether it's three billion or four billion or five i don't know but at some point i think you have to um, you can't be surprised that the big managers can't deliver the same returns. I don't know whether that is how that flies with you, Eric, but uh, that's just my observation. Moritz, what do you think? I'm a big fan of uh, the smaller trend following firms. I I think it is problematic to uh, to produce sustainable, consistent trend following returns at a level north of five billion. I just don't see that. You're losing too much diversification on the commodity markets, some of the smaller markets that I like to trade, which I think are, at least for my PL stream, they're extremely helpful and very important. I don't want to miss out on them. So um, I think there is a there is a, a breaking point at a certain level of size where the thing just starts to decay. I, in some ways, I agree with you guys. In other ways, I don't. Uh, so three years ago, I would have agreed with virtually everything you're saying. Um, and on on one level, I, I did like position limits are are a problem for size. And when I, and I do agree with the five billion dollar number. It's really tough because um, once you get north of five billion, you start creeping up to the point where you're more than one percent of the open interest in a lot of markets. And I don't think that you that one market participant can reasonably expect to hold more than one percent of the open interest in a market and not create all kinds of problems for themselves, whether it's with the regulators, position limits, executions, getting in, getting out. Um, so five billion is is kind of a nice round number as an upside cap. I mean, at the kind of vol that I'm looking at. So if you're a lower vol manager, obviously that number is going to move around. Um, that being said, I, I've always had a strong quote unquote small cap bias that, you know, palladium and even, you know, rubber and uh, Malaysian palm oil, that these things were really important. They were really important to me. Uh, over the last, you know, I took two years off, uh, went back to school, studied all the machine learning and artificial intelligence and data science stuff, um, which I do not use, by the way. And uh, I had a lot of free time to question my previous assumptions, to you know, reproduce previous research, create new research, and ask uncomfortable questions. And it was pretty conclusive to me that the small cap advantage is nowhere near as significant as I thought it was originally. That if you concentrate in the most liquid markets, the results are pretty darn good historically, even with the simplest uh, plain vanilla trend following approaches, uh, which was surprising. But you know, this is this this journey I've been on. I've been surprised many times. Um, 
I even went so far as to quote unquote market cap weight all futures positions. And I used open interest as a proxy for market cap so that your crude oil position is 20 times the size of your heating oil position and so on and so forth. Results are look great, um, which means you can handle, you know, $5 billion pretty easily. So, and all of this was surprising to me. And like I said, I want to agree with what you guys are saying. And, and I do philosophically, but when I look at the data and I just strip away all my biases and say, well, can you just, the S&P 500 of managed futures, just concentrate aggressively in the biggest markets and let it rip? What does that look like? It looks great. It's interesting um, to hear that. What I, what I, what I wonder uh, when you say that is, you know, I wonder how far back you went. And the reason I say that is because I actually think that certainly in the last perhaps decade, commodities hasn't really been a great, source of returns for for what we do right so and you know if you're concentrating on fixed income because they're liquid and they're large you would have done probably better than fully diversified i mean in the last decade diversification didn't really help in many ways so i think that certain going through certain periods i think what you're saying makes perfect sense um our research suggests that in the very long run all markets should have the same opportunity to trend and the same ability to deliver the same returns there should be no difference but i but i'm cognizant that we've had 35 30 37 whatever with number it is now by now years of big trends in fixed income for example um and that might skew our the data we get when we look at say financials that are super liquid versus commodities and also the other thing and i don't know if this is valid but i just want to throw it out there we know from trend following systems that most of the money we make is from the long side at least and again that could be influenced by fixed income you know in the last 30 40 years which is usually the data set a lot of people look at um and we know that short sided trades are more difficult to be profitable. And so when you look at commodities um, the last number of years, and actually commodities in general, they spend more time trading down than they do trading up in terms of time. So I can see that the data, if you, you know, if you just hit a certain period of time, I think your conclusion would be correct. But I wonder if you really went kind of long term and had a couple of cycles uh, if that's even possible from a backtesting point of view, I I wonder whether um, it it wouldn't favor the fully diverse. This is a, I mean, by the way, Eric, this is a conversation that Moritz and Jerry and I have on an ongoing basis. One of those, it's one of those things that can really get us get us going when we talk about diversification. Because on our side, we actually don't we don't we don't we trade fifty five markets, right? And we think we get quite a lot of diversification there, but. But of course, Morris, he would like to trade many more markets. Um, and so we have, I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying that there are different ways of of doing trend following, uh, for sure. Well, your observation about the fixed income trade potentially overly influencing the results is a, it's a smart thing. It's a smart question to ask. Uh, so what I've done to try to answer that question in the past is, when I'm doing simulations and back tests, I, I go back to 1972. Uh, that was the year I was born. Um, and I think that that captures most plausible market environments. You, know, you have the stagflation, you have the Goldilocks environment of the 90s, you have the deflation of the 2000s, so on and so forth. The problem is you have these asynchronous start dates for different markets. So in a lot of cases, you, you have to make a decision about do you want to create synthetic markets going back in time? And do you have a real understanding of what the cost of carry was back then, storage cost, term structure, uh, contango backwardation, that kind of stuff? It's, you know, AQR has done a lot of work in that area, but a lot of that's guesswork. Not, I'm not criticizing AQR. I'm just saying anyone who does that kind of work, it's, it's not easy. So, and I have probably spent a quarter of my life agonizing over the proper way to backtest dealing with survivorship bias and trying to replicate history as it actually unfolded and including things like pork bellies and broilers and things that you would have been trading, but you don't know about today. 
Um, you know, I've had to order books and have them delivered and then hand enter currency data from years ago. You know, if you want to go back into the 1920s and try to capture the Great Depression, uh, there's no convenient solution for any of this. But I'm going off on a tangent here. Let me get back to the, the important thing you brought up, and that is have bonds unduly influenced the results and are people making erroneous decisions because of this amazingly profitable liquid trend we had in bonds. So I worry about that too and have for a long time. Uh, so one of the things that I do to try to resolve that is when I do a simulation, I kick out entire sectors and just rerun. So let's say I do a simulation on a hundred markets and it comes back and it looks great. And I say, okay, um, kick out all fixed income and rerun and force the risk units that would have been deployed to fix income to flow into the other markets on some sort of proportional basis and show me the delta between that and the old results and do a Monte Carlo simulation on that. And if it's meaningfully different, well, then that there's information in that. So, and I remember doing a big project years ago where uh, we had some institutions looking at some of the products that we had. Uh, this was probably 2011, no, 12. And um, they brought that up. They're like, well, you know, without fixed income, CTAs wouldn't have made any money. So how would you answer the question? And I said, well, one attempt would be to kick out fixed income, leave everything the same and run it. Um, you kick out this amazing sector that was incredibly profitable and the results that come back are just marginally worse than the original results because you were forced to reallocate that risk into other trends. Now you missed the entire fixed income bull market, but you were forced to participate in other things. So instead of having a sharp ratio of 0.8, it came back at 0.76, but it didn't tank your entire system. In fact, if you stand far enough away from the equity curve chart, you don't really notice a difference. Now that is, that's the sign of a durable system in my opinion. So I don't know if that's the greatest approach or if there's other things you can do, but that's how I convinced myself that I could just miss out on entire sectors. You know, that 40 year bull market in fixed income, I'm not afraid of not having that going forward. Other questions about fixed income, like can CTAs benefit from a rising interest rate environment? That's even more perplexing to me. Of course they can. You know, there's on the risk-free rate of return side, you can capture it there. Um, and there's some term structure challenges to being short fixed income. So it's not directly proportional, but I don't see why everyone's so freaked out over a rising interest rate environment. Well, I mean, I can add to that because we actually traded back in the 70s, right? We started in 74. So from 76 to 81, we had a massive rise in interest rates. And, and all those years, not that I'm suggesting that the future will be the same and past performance and all of that stuff, have to be careful with that. But it was a very profitable period for our trend following strategy. So I agree with you. And, and actually, it's interesting because I remember a few years ago, certain members of our industry were trying to make the case when interest rates started to go down to re what what we thought were low levels at the time, how long-term trend follows, you know, you shouldn't be invested with them because they're not going to make money when interest rates starts to go up. But I mean, again, five years later, surprise, surprise, interest rates are still going down. And, and who's to say we can't make money when they at some point start their 35, 40 year, um, you know, bear market. Um, so um, yeah, absolutely. What about trend following on individual stocks? That's kind of another topic that we love getting into both. But um, and I know you wrote a paper about that. Uh, I think actually Moritz knows more about it than I do. But uh, it's it's a topic that is interesting. It's something Jerry often um, brings up because he does trade single stocks. Uh, we don't, uh, and Moritz doesn't either. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, what what have, what have you found in your research about that? And is that actually what you do, or do you just trade the indices or ETFs or something like that? So uh, trend following on individual stocks is something I did for a living for a long time, since from 2005 to 2018. Uh, it was effective. Um, I ran a strategy that was very, very similar to what I published in those papers that I wrote back in, I think, 2006. Uh, it was effective. 
uh, operationally challenging. Um, when you hold a portfolio that's got, you know, 1,600 long positions, you have a lot of corporate actions, you have a lot of dividends and splits and mergers and divestitures, uh, a lot of t tax um, optimization going on. Um, it's great in a hedge fund structure or with your own money. Doing it in a um, in a 40 act fund or an ETF is, is very challenging. And what I learned is um, n nothing surprised me. Uh, we, we got the results that I thought we would get. It was totally in line and it, I think it's a good strategy and it makes sense. I'm not doing it now though. Um, my previous firm does it and they probably do a good job and it's, it's their product now. I chose to not complicate my equity exposure because what I'm focused on now is scalability durability, tax efficiency, and I guess, I don't know if this is a word, understandability. <laughs> <laughs> and um, having run a an active, high breadth individual stock trading program for a long time, yeah, the, the returns look great, but after fees and transaction costs and taxes and all that stuff, you know, a lot of that nominal alpha just kind of goes away and you're left with this outperformance, I guess, um, nice downside protection, but it just, you know, 70% of what shows up in a paper kind of goes away in real life after you pay all your taxes and fees and everything. So I, um, I don't do that. I like just collecting the equity market risk premium from super low fee, low tax ETFs. And I, a year ago or two years ago, if you'd asked me, is, or this is, is this what you're going to do? I, I wouldn't have been as convinced as I am now. But when you look under the hood at the microstructure of how these ETFs function and how the cost savings from custody fees and the tax loss harvesting and just the way they do it, it's, there's no way to compete with the vanguards and Black Rocks and State Streets of the world. Um, they really have squeezed out virtually every unnecessary cost and ETFs at three basis points are, are, are a good deal in my opinion and a great way to get tax efficient equity beta uh, and I just couldn't make an argument uh, for what I'm doing going forward for a more complicated uh, approach. Now I only say this in the context of having uh, a, a relatively aggressive managed futures program on the other side of the portfolio. Without that you know, I wouldn't be this brave. I wouldn't be so calm uh, right now because obviously I own a bunch of ETFs and they're down a lot. Um, but I've got the managed futures portfolio, which is making life a lot, a lot easier. So I come across as brave because I'm always prepared and I always have enough managed futures to allow me to sleep at night. You take that away, you're going to see a different person. Speaking about ETFs, are you worried about what's happening in that market right now? We've obviously seen a lot of discounts happening uh, in, to the NAV because essentially you, you're giving people a very liquid instrument to trade, but the underlying assets may not be certainly turned out to be as liquid. Um, are you worried about the whole um, success of ETFs in terms of becoming such a dominant part of the financial industry? So again, I have some strong opinions about this that are going to be pretty contrarian, I think, to the uh, to most people's opinions. Um, that phenomenon, that problem, is pretty common in the fixed income world. Uh, it's going to be less common <clears throat> in stocks, and especially if you're talking about large cap stocks. So when you're looking at, you know, the Vanguard Total Market uh, Index or the Spiders or something like that. You know, the, these you can make in-kind distributions. You're not going to get these big deviations. Um, it's not very likely. So I don't worry about it too much when it comes to equities. When it comes to bonds like munis and um, other less liquid bonds, I actually see the ETF as solving problems, not creating them. And I say that because the reason you get a premium or a discount is because people are aggressively buying or selling the ETF uh, and the underlying. So in the primary market, though, you can't actually go trade these muni bonds as fast as the ETF traders want to trade uh, the ETF. So but that doesn't mean that the problems with the ETF, the ETF is probably correctly priced. You know, as people have done studies on markets that have closed overseas and then, you know, that market, some regional market will have an ETF in the U.S. and it'll trade at a huge discount and then it'll trade at a premium. 
And people have done analysis and come back and said, well, the ETF actually got it right. Everyone was screaming and freaking out that it was you know, trading at a discount as if that discount wasn't justified. But if you did go into the primary market and liquidate all the underlying assets, you'd see that what you got was probably pretty close to where the ETF was actually trading. So in a sense, the ETF is actually a derivative that's a discounting mechanism that's clearing the market um, without forcing the primary market to actually transact. Does that make sense to you guys? It does. Yeah. So I don't think these ETFs, I don't think these premiums and discounts are a crime or an error. I think that they're just giving people the liquidity to express their views and get rid of their fears and to buy the stuff they want to buy without forcing the primary market to actually take action and move stuff where the bid-ask spreads are a lot higher. So a lot of the people that you know have a business of picking up ETFs or funds that trade at discount to NAV, they may not actually getting a discount or like a risk-free type of return on that. They may just be paying the fair price. Yes. Correct. I saw a funny comment from, uh, I think uh, uh, I think he said Jeffries, Christopher Wood, uh, he was saying this week, uh, the commoditized equity and bond investing in an indicious way, which ultimately creates a dangerous illusion of liquidity. True, ETFs are cheap. But so is fast food. <laughs> so. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you have any concerns about like ETFs in general or all the like the passive money that is that has, you know, gained so much weight as a proportion of the overall assets that are allocated to markets? More and more of that money is passively allocated. It's probably insensitive to price, looking for the close, looking for the settlement, market cap weighted all the time. Do you see any structural problems with that? No more so than you get in any other industry. Um, I really like to draw parallels between what we do and other industries. And, and I do this because I think it's important to understand that um, these things that could cause imbalances that make people uncomfortable, they're not sins. They're not crazy. They're very consistent with what you see in any industry as it matures. So what do we have now? Maybe 45% passive? 40%, something like that, it's going to keep going and it's going to keep embedding kind of a leveraging component into the swings and the signal to noise ratio will get noisier until you have some sort of a crisis, um, which we may be on the cusp of right now, that is going to stress the system. It's going to push it to a breaking point. And I don't mean the whole system breaking. I mean, certain aspects of the system will break and that's completely normal. That's a part of society and evolution and it's 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 not the word crisis is i think a a misnomer i mean we have crises all the time they're not it's not the end of the world so um i don't know where that balances out but it in, in almost all aspects of life you've got kind of these um coattail riders that provide liquidity uh, and sometimes they're they're taking liquidity and i just don't see it as a problem now if we get to the point where it's 90% passive and 10% active I'm going to think like that, that's unstable. The fulcrum point is too close to the engine and that thing's swinging around all over the place. But at 45%, I just, I don't think so. I think it's just a natural evolution and I think it'll just keep going um, and it'll find its breaking point and then it'll back off from there and then you'll have some sort of equilibrium going forward. Moritz, where do you want to go with Eric? Obviously, we're coming up to the hour point, so we have to be conscious about uh, time. I've got a few different things I want to uh, ask uh, Eric about, but uh... just maybe to wrap it up on the uh, the single stock trend following. So, Eric, what I understood is you're saying, you know, after all the costs and the commissions are taken into account that you need to pay uh, because you're trading cash equities. And I, I assume you've traded cash equities, not the single stock futures, because not, not all of those stocks probably would be tradable through single stock futures. So you're trading the cash equities, I guess. You're correct. And, um, so you're saying after all, you know, I'm not sure if you targeted the close and if you participated in the auctions, but after all the commissions have been paid and after all the costs that relate to the strategy, it's in your opinion, not that much of an added value, uh, compared to being long only. No, it's it's still considerable. Um, there was a, a reasonable amount of alpha and a lot better um, downside protection, meaning, um, you know, instead of a 50% drawdown in 08, you know, somebody doing a good job that didn't get unlucky could be looking at something like, you know, 30% drawdown or 25, something like that, with a little bit higher annualized return. That, that was my experience. That, that's what I saw. 
Um, I left something out that, that is important. So my job is to run multi-asset portfolios now. And that means combining uh, managed futures trend following with equities. And at first, what I wanted to do was do the best job I could on equities with all the systems and trend following and risk controls and whatnot, and do the best job I could on managed futures as well. And I did that, and I, I liked what I saw a lot. But I also looked at just pure equity beta, just get rid of all the complexity and just go with the beta and combine that with managed futures. And even though pure beta is mildly inferior, in my opinion, to the active equity approach, it combines more nicely with managed futures. It's one of those, you know, counterintuitive things where if you mix uh, two elements together, the, the, the sum of that is greater than the absolute value of some of the parts. Just raw global equity beta mixes better with managed futures than the kind of trend following on equities that I was um, inclined to do. And I'll tell you why. It's because trend following has a blind spot. And you know what it is. It's the recovery. After the washout, during the recovery period, when correlations are broken and trends are broken and you're sitting on a ton of cash, and it turns out that my style of trend following on equities has a blind spot, and those two blind spots overlap to a large degree, a large degree. So the trend following on equities was, in my experience, was pretty highly correlated with trend following on futures. It wasn't a 0% correlation like you get between a global equity beta and managed futures. So it's one of those situations where if you look at things on an individual basis and give them a grade, the local grade, and then add them together and you get a result. Whereas if you grade them based upon their mutual dependence, you know, how do they complement each other? You get very different and counterintuitive results. I agree with that. I think you could probably, I'm guessing here, make the same point if you applied a trend following strategy to say an equity index as opposed to the cash equities you would probably find that same blind spot. Yes. Meaning, you know, say you run a 200 day moving average on the S&P or a crossover, whatever it is, or on a basket of equity indices, uh, you'll probably see that correlating uh, more positively with a diversified global futures trend following program than you would see the S&P as a standalone product. And therefore, this is what you're saying, because of those, you know, the diversification benefit of being pure beta long only together with trend following is greater than if you had two trend following systems, even though it's superior, right? From a mm -hmm. return and risk just return point of view on a standalone basis, but the combination is inferior. Correct. That's, that's a good way of saying it. I should have just said that. <laughs> now, speaking of, you know, things you've mentioned about multi-asset and blending equities with uh, trend following, um, especially, I guess, in the last, since the financial crisis, where it's been very hard for managed futures to keep up. It's been very hard for anything, really, to keep up with equities. So I guess if you can't beat them, blend them. Um, and so um, part of the challenge we face as, as you know, as, as someone offering a product that is would be really good for any equity investor, because as we've kind of alluded to, I mean, we believe that a trend following managed futures portfolio will allow you to own your equities, right? Um, but but in any ways, um, the challenge that we face and the challenge, you know, that, of course, everyone faces is just, you know, the narrative, how do we, how do we talk about these things? And, of course, you know, many, many moons ago, when I started in this industry, it was all about the black box and how people were, you know, there's always something negative. So I know some of the things you guys have worked on and, and done really well is is coming up with some different kinds of narratives or ways to kind of uh, talk about uh, the benefit of blending uh, these uh, types of investment. And I'm thinking of three things that I've come across uh, in speaking with uh, uh, with Matt on your side and and one of them is called the experiment I think you I hope you know what I'm referring to I do, I so <laughs> yeah so why don't you so I'd like to go through these three 
narratives because I think they're so uh, they're 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 good uh, and hopefully they'll be really useful for for our audience as well. So why don't we start with the experiment and and we talk about you know that? Sure. Uh, let me just um, point out that how we got to these narratives was by listening. One thing I notice, and I include myself in this criticism, is in our industry, we are the worst listeners on the on the planet. We don't listen to our clients. We view their complaints as irrational and illogical, and I did it too when I was younger. And things turned around for me, and life became a lot easier once I started listening and asking questions, being a good investigator and finding out. It's kind of like what I talked about earlier where you said, you know, everyone knows the market can decline by 30%. Everyone knows we can have a pandemic and then it happens and they throw a fit and you get upset and throw your arms up in the air saying that you knew. But the real culprit is they just weren't prepared. So let's focus on the, the actual root cause issue. So these narratives that we're talking about, I believe, are the result of us asking intellectually honest questions, trying to get to root causes and, and doing a good job of listening to clients. So one way I attempted to do this over the last couple of years is when I would sit down with a financial advisor, I would show him or her a chart um, or a spreadsheet that included the annual returns of the global stock market or the U.S. stock market going back to, say, 1980 or 1990, whatever. And they would and I would identify it. And they would say, okay, I get it, so what? And then I would show the returns of a managed futures index in the next column, you know, using the Barclays CTA index or the New Edge index. Or there's a whole bunch of different indexes out there, and some of which are intellectually honest, others aren't. But nevertheless, I would show them what I considered to be a one measurement of the beta of managed futures and ask them, how would you feel about making a 5% allocation to this? And inevitably they would all essentially do the same thing. They would go down the spreadsheet and look at the annual returns and they would get to a year where the market was up, managed futures was down and they'd say, ugh, yeah, I can't do that. They'd go down a little bit more and find a year where the market was up 30 and managed futures is only up four and it'd be like, ugh, well, can't do that. And as soon as they found the third one, they would just, you know, shake their head and say, no, I, I couldn't do this. You know, I would lose all my clients and here and exactly here is where I would lose them. And I, I typically would follow up and say, you know, come on, you know, if, even a 5% allocation, you can see how uncorrelated it is. It's diversifying. And then, you know, people would look at it and they'd say, no, nine out of 10 people said no. A 5% allocation is not enough to make a difference, but it's definitely enough to cause problems. Absolutely not. So, and it was actually like 9.5 out of 10 said no. So I tricked them. I took managed futures and I blended it with that equity index 50 50 and I put that up there, but I didn't tell them what it was. I put a big question mark at the top and I called it the mystery asset class. And I said, what do you think of this? And of course they did the same thing. They start going down the list they're looking at the relative performance year by year, skipping over those problem years, pausing a little bit, but skipping. And then they get to the end and they say, now 9.5 out of 10 people say, yeah, this, this is a, this looks pretty good. It's got nice up capture. It's not down as much as the market. Um, if this isn't something crazy, I'm interested. This, this is what I'm talking about, which in, inside I'm just shaking my head. Um, so then here's where it gets interesting. I would, uh, I would not reveal the mystery asset class. I would ask them how they feel about a 10% allocation. And now eight out of 10 people would say, you know, if it's not something crazy, if this isn't Bitcoin or something, yeah, I could see if those are real, I could, I could see myself doing 10%. And then I would, uh, I would reveal the asset class and, uh, just let them think about it for a couple minutes. And most of them figured out that, well, a 10% allocation to a 50, 50 split is mathematically the same thing as a pure 5% allocation. But you went from a 90% fail rate to almost a 90% success rate, but nothing changed under the hood. It's simply the packaging, the framing, and what that does to your client's psychology and the, the emotional impact of those returns hitting the statement. And that is amazing to me. I mean, I love that story. I think it's, um, yeah, 
I mean, it it, it tells you a lot, um, but it also illustrates this whole point about, um, you know, when we see things individually versus when we see things that are blended. And then I get on to the next narrative that you have, something called the crazy gym, which I <laughs> when I saw the headline, I thought, what the hell is that? The crazy gym. So uh, tell me about the crazy gym. You know, this goes back to the concept we were talking about um, earlier about what does it take to be an investor? Um, it's, it's kind of the same. What does it take to be an athlete or what does it take to be a dieter? And this, this, this thing I keep bringing up over and over that there is no alchemy. You don't get something for nothing. So when an investor is upset that they've experienced some volatility or drawdown and you sit down with them and you explain, look, you gave your money to someone else and they're going to earn a return for you and you don't have to do anything. Just you just hand your money over and then you're going to get more money back. Surely you don't believe that. You don't believe that there, that you have to give up nothing. You know that the cost of doing this is volatility and drawdowns. So for then for you to be upset and angry when the volatility and drawdowns happens means that there's some disconnect here. You don't either didn't understand that was the cost or you didn't believe it um, or you're crazy. I mean, that's basically what it is. So in order to put that into real life terms, I came up with the concept of the crazy gym. So at the crazy gym, you go there and you don't have to work out. You never sweat. You never feel any pain. You just walk through the doors. If you pay your 30 bucks a month, you get into fantastic, great shape. And it's a pyramid scheme too. You can set up a downstream. You can bring people in. Nobody has to do anything. You just show up and you look like a Baywatch supermodel. Nobody in their right mind would buy that story. They would say, no, come on. I don't believe any of that. You don't, there is no something for nothing. It doesn't make any sense. Everyone would roll their eyes, but that's not that different from the crazy investor. So who would believe that? But it's the same people that are upset that they're experiencing drawdown or volatility. But I see almost no difference between those two analogies. Yeah. And then you, I think you even go on and I think that's actually the other thing I was thinking about um was um this thing about when you go into say chipotle and you look at all the various dishes i mean you wouldn't you wouldn't eat them individually right you wouldn't eat your rice on your own you wouldn't eat the meat on your i mean you blend it together and actually taste better and it's kind of the same what, what you're saying with the investment i mean why don't we just blend it and we get a better experience yeah, I mean, it's, it depends on the person I'm talking to. I have different metaphors and analogies for different audiences, but I, I like the Chipotle one. Uh, I don't know why in financial services we think we've created this massive workload for all of us where we have to break every single investment out and then put it on a line item and calculate its alpha and its beta and benchmark it to its own benchmark and just create all this statement risk, all this homework, when our job is to build portfolios to compound wealth in a way that's responsible over the long term and put portfolio math on our side. Why do we then disaggregate all that and then dump it on the client and make them experience all the, the cognitive uh, biases that they can possibly have? So in order to, to explain this to somebody who doesn't do what we do for a living, um, I said, that's the equivalent of going to Chipotle. And the first section, you get your sour cream and they put it on a little dish. And then the second section, you pick your meat and they put that on a little dish. And then you get your salsa, then you get your onions, then you get your avocado. And then you go sit down and you eat them one at a time. You eat all the onions and you say, hmm, you know, I didn't really like that. Um, and I've had better onions before. So you're benchmarking the onions and you're talking about the alpha and whatnot. And then you put those aside and then you eat the entire tortilla and you say, well, it was a decent tortilla. You know, it's pretty good. It had some alpha. And then you eat all the beans. Like who would do that? Yet we do that with our portfolios all the time and without blending them together <laughs> into a burrito, AKA a portfolio. So yeah, it's, it's humorous. Um, but that is the way I see the world. And if you're paying me to build you a portfolio and compound your wealth, let's evaluate that. And that's actually reminds me of the third example I was thinking of, which I think is the, uh, the story about, um, you know, Michelle and her two advisors, if I'm not, uh, misremembering oh yeah i don't use this one it's, very maybe often. it's not michelle but maybe it's something we'll go with michelle maybe she has a new name every time i don't know yeah we'll go with michelle so michelle uh's father passed away he lived to be 96 or whatever and she inherited his uh 
his portfolio and, and, you know, she's had the same advisory firm for years and, and she likes them and knows them. And so she's learning about investments and uh, starting to pay attention to that kind of stuff. And then something happens and the two partners at the firm split and they go their separate ways. And she doesn't know who to go with because she's known them both for a while now. And she decides to split the middle and say, all right, well, Bob's going to take 50% and Kevin's going to take 50% and I'm just going to, you know, no conflict, just give them both 50%. And then three years goes by and you're having a conversation with Michelle and she says, oh my goodness, Kevin has done such a better job than Bob. I mean, I do not know what Bob's doing. I don't get it. I don't understand. But my experience with Kevin has been fantastic. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to fire Bob because it's just been so volatile and the performance and then it's complex and he seems to be doing a lot of stuff I don't understand. Um, so I'm going to have to fire him and give all the money to Kevin. What she doesn't realize is that they're both using the exact same model. They didn't deviate at all. They're using the same tamp with the same managers, but Bob decided in his infinite wisdom to go get this advanced software that instead of showing her the portfolio level results, he cracked it open and he had betas and alphas and covariances and outperformance and projections and analysts and all this stuff, but she's got the same portfolio with each advisor, but a completely different experience. And that I believe is accurate. That is how the world, that is how normal human beings interpret complexity when it comes to money. Yeah. Going back to the point about us showing up as a line item, even in our, I mean, it's, this is something I've come across so many times is that you can either buy, you know, our standard leverage program, or you can buy you know, half leverage and, you know, put in twice the amount of money. And a lot of people choose to put in twice the amount of money in a half leverage, you know, product because it's easier to show when you go through your quarterly or annual investment committee, you don't have to explain much um, because this, the volatility is lower. So interesting how the human brain uh, challenges us as investors. I'm sure you're also a fan of the, a lot of the behavioral biases that actually makes us, you know, a very valuable component of, of any in, in, in investment portfolio. But, you know, we are our worst own enemy um, when it comes to investing, that's for sure. Well, and there's no safety in being in first place either. I mean, I know lots of CTAs, their biggest redemptions came in 2008 when they were in first place. Because they're the only ones. Oh, they'll were... come this year. As well. You know, I, I think definitely that some people will have to... Um, get liquidity from all the stuff that they bought and now have lost money on. And the only ones who can provide them that liquidity is the CTAs. I think that for sure. Yeah. So it's the dispersion. If you go from first to worst, worst to first, that's a very dangerous place to be. If you want to manage people's wealth over the long term, you have to hold on to their wealth. And that means never being in last place, which means sometimes you got to give up being in first place. That doesn't mean you won't finish in first place at the end. It just means that you're a marathon runner, not a series of relay guys that are running, you know, the 200 yard sprints. So, and that, you know, the, the, there's an ego component that I think people have to get past in order to ex they accept that we're not trying to win awards. We're not trying to be in first place. You can't help people if you're not doing business with them and you can't do business with them. If you put them in a position where they're in agony based upon line item risk, statement risk and relative performance. So if you can do a good job and build a, a multi-asset portfolio that just uh, kind of splits the middle and compounds wealth at a reasonable rate over time. Well, that's my thesis about how to manage money. So, but before we get too deep into this, I really want to ask Moritz if he wants to talk about the energy trade. I, I just feel like he wants to talk about the energy trade right now and, and that a lot of people don't want to talk about it. So what do you say? You mean crude oil? All of them the entire energy space. Is there anything you want to say about that? Well, I, I love being on that trade right now. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, last year, I remember in the summer, we got chopped a little bit by crude oil. The direction of that market wasn't all that clear. And then uh, all of a sudden, I had that short position on. And then I had a little bit more on, and then some. And it just moved very nicely down. Then it gapped down. And then you had the feeling, well, now it has to come back up again because, you know, it's getting close to 20. It has, it, it cannot be at 20, but I think being short is the right thing to do. And it's, it's the position that's been making the most money in the past couple of days and weeks. And that's really holding the portfolio up very nicely for me. 
Same's true in net gas, same's true in heating oil, same's true in gasoline, all of them. The distillates, crude, net gas. You know, I've been out of the game for a couple of years until I relaunched um, in January. And uh, my program was looking at really large short positions in the energy space. And I went and looked at it and thought, wow, that's, that's, that's an uncomfortable trade if you're not using uh, a disciplined system. It's extremely uncomfortable trade, just like kind of like buying bonds uh, when interest rates are really low and potentially going negative. And um, I remember talking with my, my equity partners um, and the chairman of our board here, Tom Basso, um, you know, we all agree that the, those uncomfortable trades are the ones that you can never skip. You know, that's just our philosophy. And, and I don't begrudge other people that for risk management reasons say, you know, it's just, it's not for us. Um, but I, I, I stick with my thesis that we provide liquidity to hedgers and they, they, they want to buy markets low and sell them high. And if we try to pick and choose whether we're going to participate or not, you know, that that's not the, in my opinion, that's not the element of a sustainable business. You either need to commit and do it or don't and be consistent. Uh, so we put those trades on. And um, it's, a, it's a scary market. But I'll point out, though, that if you look at the futures curve of crude, I think there's, what, a 60 70% negative roll yield. Yeah, it's, um, it's a super contango. And, you know, you hear a lot of people say that that super contango is there to stay for a while uh, until carry traders clear it out of the market. Or because, you know, what do we have right now? We have a demand shock you know, because the economy is kind of like in a in a standstill. There's also a supply shock, and there is crisis mode. Um, so it's kind of like all of that stuff comes together, and nobody needs that oil. Aircraft are not flying. Uh, people aren't driving to work as much. The holidays canceled. You know, stuff like that. Uh, industries aren't producing. Uh, products aren't being produced. So that contango is there. And uh, if, you know, if you roll the long position just because you want to be long, well, that's very, very costly from a roll yield point of view. Um, but, you know, in a, you can design systems, uh, you know, outside of the trend following space that, you know, may look at uh, extracting some of the carry that's available there because, you know, that contango is not a linear curve. It's, it, is, it is a concave curve. Um, and the roll yield farther down the curve is much, it's still negative, but much less severe than it is at the front end. So, you know, there are strategies that you can apply to those markets in a systematic way, which I believe, and in my experience, they are very diversifying uh, to all of the things that I'm doing. That's a good way of saying it. You know, I've had this brawl for years with other CTAs, and it's good natured brawl about shorting markets that are quote unquote down too much. You know, they don't they don't want to short something that's near the cost of production or below the cost of production or down a lot. And my response is always that, well, you know, I get it in the front month. You don't want to short something at 30 if the cost of production is 35 because you think that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not responsible and whatnot. But as a medium and long term trend follower, you're you're rolling these positions through time. And if the market's in a full carry mode um, and there's contango built in there by shorting and rolling, you're essentially becoming a synthetic storage provider for that market. And you said something more it's a minute ago about the, you can structure these trades in a way where it's extremely diversifying. Well, what could be more diversifying than being a synthetic storage provider in some commodity? You know, how, why would that be correlated to your bond position or or something like that? So, and, and I call these uh, super trades. When you get um, a market's in full carry, it's fully loaded, you got the supply shock and the demand shock at the same time, and everyone's scared to take the trade. And the term structure implied roll yield is, you know, 60, 70, 80% a year. That's what happened with natural gas back in, what year was it, 2010 or 11? And that became one of the greatest trend following trades of all time. You just went short, super liquid. You can roll you know, set there seven, 10, 12 contracts out and just keep rolling this trade. And everyone's beating their head up against the wall. They can't understand why people are making so much money being short natural gas. Well, it all becomes clear later on fracking and other things and whatnot. So here we are with crude oil and I see people saying, ah, I can't take this trade. And I, it just makes me beat my head against the wall. But nevertheless, I just, you know, there, there's a debate in the space about that. And I just wanted to get my opinion out there. 
No, I mean, you have to take those trades. I mean, just I'm looking at the crude oil curve right now. It's just, you know, for the listener's benefit, um, front month is trading around 23 and a half, two years out. So this is 2022 is at uh, close to 37. So this is how steep that contango curve is. And one of the point I also want to make is um, in those energy markets, in a trend following system, energy curves are fairly liquid you know, up to the one, even two year point. If you're not too large of a CTA, then those points are tradable for you as a smaller type of CTA. That is not true for some of the other futures markets. For instance, bond markets, right? It's kind of like everything's in the front month, all the later month aren't even available for you to trade because the contracts haven't launched yet. But in net gas, in crude oil, in heating oil, the entire curve is kind of like there for you to trade. And there's absolutely, in my opinion, no reason to force your system to be constantly rolling front month contracts and have this as your market. This is, you could, you could do that and then say, well, I'm also looking at the second month out, the third month out, the fourth month out, and I'm generating generic time series on those contract points all the way up to like, say, 15 months out. And then you, you know, trade them as a basket, giving mini weights to all of those points on the curve. And maybe that you'll then find that eventually you'll have more weight on the 12 month point than you have on the, on the front month. Or you could say, depending on the shape of the curve, you're rolling into different products, into different maturities. And if for whatever reason you ran a system that, you know, forces you to be long, well, maybe you don't want to be long, uh, the April contract or the May contract right now, maybe you want to be long deck 22. Yes, I, I completely agree. Well, I think it's really important to trade the whole curve. Um, I do it on a proportional basis. So I'll participate out to, I think it's 18 months out, uh, proportional to the to the open interest. And it's also important, and we're getting into stuff that I think a lot of people aren't interested in, but it's, it's really important to understand the impact that the term structure has on the time series that you're taking signals on a lot of trend followers don't realize how much carry they're getting um all you gotta do is go back and look at the peso in the 90s during the tequila crisis to see how much of an impact you know term structure can make um but anyways that that's a super detailed topic that probably is not a good way to end a podcast so so i know but it is an important podcast because it applies to the turkish lira it applies to the ruble it applies to commodities right and if you really if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of a trend following system, I think at some point when you look into the, under the hood, bond markets as well, there's carry there too. You have to figure out what impact that has on your portfolio because there is a carry, positive or negative, that you're getting from those markets. Because 100% of, agree. Because we're trading futures, futures is forward, so it does apply interest rates, storage costs, dividend yields, all of that, right? So it's the cost of carry. And that cost of carry is dynamic over time. And to just disregard it, I think, well, well, one way of going it, or you can have a more detailed look and figure out if there's something that you want to do with that information. Well, very well said. Couldn't agree more. And maybe one point to those difficult traits. Um, in my experience with, you know, say, trend following on 20 years, I the, the diff, difficult trades. I've had one. I think was it last week, Niels, when I said I'm. I got a signal to short the Bitcoin futures contract. Uh, it was last week, so uh, I took the trade because the system told me to short Bitcoin, Bitcoin futures. Um, it makes my stomach turn. Not as much as it would have, you know, 15 years or so ago, uh, because you know that market is super volatile. Maybe the thing goes to 10,000 or 100,000. But right now, I'm short. Um, and be that crude oil, oil, there are so many, but if I take the bottom line, those super difficult trades to take on average have been money makers. They're not losers, even though they are stomach turning. You know, you, you bring up an interesting point. I built a crypto trading system for some <clears throat> people, just friends. And, um, when I was doing that, I, I looked at it in the context of just trading cryptos. And, you know, I looked at it and said, no way, that's just, it's too chaotic. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it in the context of a diversified portfolio, you're like, oh, well, I can do this. So it just, things are relative. It matters what's going on in your life, you know, how much of the risk budget. I mean, I think I saw Bitcoin was down 40% in one day. Um, and I looked at it and there was no, 
there was no way to get out, you know, unless you were trading intraday with a small size. And, yeah, and it, I know it, some guys that do it this. It gaps over the weekend. You're, you're just, this yeah. is why. Appropriately well, I, sized, even though it's just one contract, right? So, okay, it's one contract. That may be the appropriate size. Yeah, yeah. It's Well, oil gaps down 30% over the weekend. So, you know, it does happen. Yeah, and that's a much bigger market. And that's a much bigger yeah, that, that was eye-opening for me. Yeah. I, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to run through where we are performance-wise for the indices we follow, and then I want to come back to you and ask you what we missed today, what are the things you just want to kind of bring up if there's anything. So let me just say to everyone that these numbers, as, of, as usual, they are as of Thursday evening, and with these markets we have at the moment, um, there's probably a little bit of dispersion in the returns. Uh, Friday, I guess, was probably uh, for most uh, CTAs a, a positive day, but just bear that in mind. Now, it's also interesting when I go through the various indices to just notice the difference that we are seeing this month. So the beta, 40, uh, sorry, the beta 50 index, which is not the 50 largest, is actually the 20 largest CTAs open to new investors. That's actually down 2.4% this month. Uh, and down 3.5% for the year. Uh, the SOC Gen CT index uh, down 58 basis points for the month um, and down 1.21% for the year. The SOC Gen trend index is probably most close to home for, for the three of us, is up this month 1.28% and up 1.75% for the year. And then the SOC Gen short-term traders index, which you would think would have amazing opportunities at the moment, the short-term guys. It's up about 70 basis points for the month, up 3.96% of the uh, for the year. And then the Bridge Alternatives Index, the flat fee uh, index, um, up 3.5% for the month, up almost 3% for the year. So quite a bit of dispersion between the various indices, uh, which is interesting. Um, um, so, yeah, no, I just wanted to ask you, Eric, before we wrap up, um, if there is anything um, you wanted to bring up, something we, we missed, obviously we will have to have you back because we can, you know, it's been an hour and a half and we're still scratching the surface, I feel, in terms of uh, things we could talk about. I'm sure our audience feels the same, but is there anything today that you just want to um, bring up or... Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I really enjoyed this conversation a lot. It's a rare pleasure for me. I haven't done a lot of talking over the last couple of years, and you guys are you guys are informed, and you talk about stuff intelligently. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna now start listening to your podcasts. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the uh, the dispersion you bring up is a, is a sore point uh, for me, specifically in the trend following space. Um, it's it's not making my job easier when there's this much dispersion and I it's because I don't know why I don't know why some CTAs are down a lot this year a trend you know trend following CTAs um, and it's it, it's something I really want to try to get an answer to because I don't see how that I, I couldn't figure out a way to be down this year at least in trend following futures I mean the trades have just been enormously profitable so I'd like to understand that because um, it makes me wonder if what I'm missing. Um, so that dispersion is a, is a source of discomfort right now. Um, but then I look at, you know, there are trend followers out there that are doing obviously trend following that are making quite a bit of money and capturing these trends. So I'm happy about that. Um, but no, that's, that's all I got for today. I really enjoyed this conversation guys. And I look forward to any future conversations. And I think we covered a lot of interesting topics, a little fragmented, but it's, mo it's mostly my fault because I go off on tangents. <laughs> no, it's been great. Oh, I apologize for that. Yeah, definitely fun conversation. And uh, I agree with you. The dispersion point is interesting because a lot of people, I think, have looked at our space and said, oh yeah, but I mean, trend followers in general have a high correlation. So only need one of them, but actually I, completely disagree with that when you look at the return dispersion over time between seemingly similar managers so yeah that's a topic for next time eric for sure but i think on that note let's wrap up this uh, week's conversation we hope you uh, enjoyed it um, and of course if you felt you got any value from it we always grateful if you would uh, head over to itunes and leave us a rating and review because it really does help other people discover the uh, podcast. So from Eric, Mortz, and me, thanks so much for listening. 
and we look forward to being back with you next week. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.